I was a correctional officer at a supermax prison. It was near Florence, Colorado. I stayed as an employee there for a half decade. I saw almost everything you can imagine. Escape attempts, stabbings, and riots. Also, sharp weaponry that was hidden in places you would rather not visualize. These are only some of the more unpleasant occurrences I have dealt with in the past. I am currently writing this on encrypted Wi-Fi from an undisclosed but safe location. I have had a change of careers following the events of the tale I am about to share with you now. I hope that people thinking about becoming prison guards read my story and reconsider any future life choices they will look back on as a mistake. The warden called me into his office on a Monday. During the entire walk there, down the hallways, I thought of the trouble I could be in. Shut the door, he said as he looked up at me from his desk after I entered. Those words sealed it in my mind. How much hot water I was in for some sort of infraction I was not aware of yet. Bureaucratic micromanaging and constant procedural changes were nothing new to me. I still hated petty political grievances. I nodded and sealed the entranceway. He demanded I take a seat, so I did. You're the best officer here, he said. I waited for the butt. I anticipated news of termination. I saw a force transfer to some mundane position filing paperwork headed my way. I want to give you an opportunity, he said. You will make 600000 in one year. Your benefits will remain unchanged. You would have less oversight than what is present for you now. You would be in a leadership position, albeit an isolated one. That sounds ideal, I said as my mind swam in the possibilities of how much profit he offered. There are only two things we ask of you. One is that you cannot tell anybody about your new position. Two is you locate somewhere else. There's a prison in the Arctic. And that is where your life will be for the next 365 days. The confusion must have been readable on my face. If your wife asks, tell her that you are going to a federal academy. There is no cell service or Wi-Fi there. Any contact you make with her must be through snail mail. We will handle the addresses given. If you decline this offer, then this conversation never happened. Do you understand? I contemplated the pros and cons. Before I became law enforcement, I was a bodyguard. I was gone from the house for extended periods. Even though it would be time with the wife lost, the fortune would help both of us. I agreed. The prison facility was a large compound, not much bigger than the place I had patrolled before. A few things jumped out at me when I first laid eyes on the populace there. They all had wounds on their faces, and they spoke a strange guttural language I was unfamiliar with. Why do they talk in such a bizarre tongue? I asked myself as I would walk down the blocks. The new warden I worked under had the last name of Buckley. He had noticeable scar tissue beneath his eyes. His attitude towards me at the beginning was hardly welcoming. If anything, he acted as though I was a burden. He seemed to resent me due to the mere possibility of having to train me on things. One evening, Buckley ordered me to do a cell extraction. Christopher Aluko was the name of the inmate we had to deal with. On the walk there, I asked my boss what Aluko had done to end up here. I'm not allowed to tell you what these scumbags have accomplished to wind up here, Buckley said. He started his career in crime by cannibalizing his sister though. Tonight, our only goal is to get him moved to the hole. He's proven himself to be way too dangerous to share a space with anyone. The doors of each cell were closer to that of an insane asylum than a prison. They were complete barriers that you could not see through. It was me and three other guards who were about to deal with this high-profile detainee. The supervisor was present, doing the thing the bosses generally do. That is to say, he remained on standby and did not get his hands dirty. Upon walking in, the first thing I saw was Aluko sitting upright on his cot. I noticed he was huge, at least 6 foot 8 and 320 pounds of pure muscle. His skin cracked all over. His face had the normal scarring that I associated with most people in the place. I'm going to need you to stand up and put your hands behind your back, I said. I kept my hand near the holster where my pepper spray was. Show me respect and I'll show you the same, I continued. You won't have handcuffs on you for long if you cooperate. 
You are not better than me, Aluko said. His voice had a baritone quality, which I expected from a man of his size. What I did not was how weird it sounded. It was as though four or five people were chanting the words in unison. All right, I said. Let's get you moved to where you need to go. The faster we do this, the better off we'll be. You shot at someone in broad daylight when you were in a gang years ago, Aluko said. It took 10 years for the paranoia to go away. The fear of the cops coming to arrest you for a potential murder before you became a low grade one yourself. To this day, you don't know if any innocent civilians got caught in the crossfire. We had to restrain his huge arms and place the metal bracelets on his wrists. He laughed all the while. As we brought him to solitary, I thought of his words and how much they unsettled me. They were true and that story from my past was one I had not told anybody. Near the end of the shift, Buckley went into one of the sniper towers and smoked a cigarette. Since my duties for the day were complete, I took the spiral staircase to the level he stood on. When I saw him, I was only a few mere inches away from where he puffed. He did not seem to mind or even care about the footsteps behind him. He focused on the distant and lowering winter sun. The caged animal back there said something which he shouldn't have, I said. Part of the job is having thick skin, he said, as he flicked his cigarette over the edge into the snow. He turned around to face me. It's not about that, I said. Did he hurt your poor little feelings? He had an insight into my past that no one has, I said as a bitter taste filled my mouth. Well, that's unfortunate. Means you lied to the oral board when you got into the position you're in now. You shouldn't lie to your employers. I need to know what kind of prison this is, I said as I felt blood rush to my head. Why does everyone have open sores all over their body and face? Are they exposed to some kind of virus, and if so are we susceptible? Either that or they're always high on something. That would explain why they're always speaking gibberish. Also, how in the hell do they know things that I haven't even told the closest people in my life? Better to do the job assigned. Don't worry about things above your pay grade. Buckley pulled out another pack of cigarettes and lit one. I hope we're not exposed to dangers we weren't warned about. I'll have to find a way to get the word out. If you break your non-disclosure agreement, it would be far worse than a termination. Your wife back home, the one with the dark curly hair and the nice curves. I'd hate to see the impact of your decisions on her. That was when I grabbed him by the lapels and shoved him to the ground. I considered throwing elbows. The idea of making him taste his blood was satisfying. I did not want to be incarcerated in this den of misery though, of all places. Buckley started laughing. What he did next took me by complete surprise. He patted me on the back with his free hand instead of trying to defend himself or resist. You've proven your point, he said as he pushed on my chest. Now get off of me. I don't want to give the signal to one of my buddies in the next tower. He has a modded Remington 700 pointed at you. I released him. After he stood and brushed some frost off, he made eye contact with me. I respect you for your bravery. Most people wouldn't be willing to do that to me, especially someone beneath me in rank. Tell you what, I'll shed a little bit of light on what kind of place this is for you, and if I ever find out you told anyone, you'll wish you would have died at birth. I felt the adrenaline start to wear off. As my energy lowered, I nodded, thereby giving tacit agreement to his new offer. I looked to my left and saw the sniper he was referring to. It occurred to me that if he wanted to take action against me, he could have had me executed right then and there. Buckley waved at me to follow him as we made our way down the steps. He escorted me through the yard. Ice encased the weight sets and pull-up bars. We followed the chain link fence to another facility that had coded key access. After we put in the correct digits, he swung the door open. We made our way down a hallway that did not seem modern. There were lit torches on the walls. The flooring was pallid cobblestone. He brought me into another room which was the size of an auditorium. A man stood up. He wore all black clothing with a white collar and it took me a while to recognize him as a priest. I saw rows of long tables, ones fit for a king in an ancient era, crucifixes, rosaries, chalices of water, and stacks of dusty books lined every corner. I skimmed some of the titles and saw that a few were in a different language. Father Lamora, Buckley said as he stared at the man of the cloth. What are you doing down here? The priest pointed to his left. When I shifted my eyes in that direction, I did not immediately notice the presence of a fourth person in the room. This one was one of the inmates tied down on a slab. 
As soon as we focused our collective attention on him, the man came to life. He started struggling against his restraints. A red-tinged substance poured from his mouth like foam from a rabid dog. I have almost driven the evil entity out, the priest said. Buckley turned to me. What is going on here? I asked. I had the irresistible urge to run screaming in the other direction. I knew I could not take my chances out in the harshest cold, but a part of me was willing to at least try. This prison's budget comes from the Vatican. We only take inmates possessed by something greater than general sadism or psychopathy. In the official government paperwork, they call this place the House of the Demonium. If you want to atone for the sins I know you are guilty of, now would be an excellent time. Help us read the incantation needed needed to cleanse this heathen. Our possessed inmates were flown in from around the world. The evening the young girl came to our gates via the bus was an unusual occurrence. The transporting officers rolled her towards me on a gurney. She fought against her restraints. She screamed in the dense and layered voice I had become used to at that point. She wore a tattered and old beige colored dress. Blood stains marked her clothing. I made a mental note to try and get her some blankets once she was in her new home. Her name was Anna. There were a few things that made her different from the others. For starters, her eyes were milky. She retained the same faraway gaze they all had, but it was as though her pupils indicated narcotic use. Her eyes never got any clearer during the entirety of my time monitoring her. There was one singular trait that made her stand out from the others. She often quieted down in her yelling once she was in the presence of the staff. The inmates usually never cared who they were in front of unless it was to unearth our secrets or to shame us. She minded her manners. This was as alarming as much as it was respectful. Once I placed her in the cell, I knew I had to bind her to the bed after removing her from the gurney. As soon as I unbuckled one of the straps on her wrists, she reached up and tried to claw at my face. I ducked her strike. I reached towards my belt for a canister. If this were a normal prison, it would have been filled with mace. Mine brimmed with holy water instead. I sprayed at her. Smoke emanated from her skin as she let loose a cry of anguish. I undid the rest of the straps and moved her to the bed. I shut the door and went to lunch. The lodging for the employees was three separate rows of cabins. The most luxurious ones belonged to leadership. The second most comfortable apartments were the priests. The third, and needless to say the most decrepit, provided shelter for the officers. Even though my space was hardly glamorous, it became my sanctuary. I was able to work out, read paperback books, and journal. These activities helped maintain my mental sanity. I stared at the ceiling and thought about how unsettled I was about the girl. Every inmate had a glimmer of humanity. Something about her made me want to investigate her past. Word spread amongst the employees how there was only one computer in the entire facility. It contained the report's database. It was in our warden's office. Rumor also circulated that he had access to the inmate's rap sheets. Buckley had verified this for me in one of our prior conversations, though it was an accident. I waited until after hours to enter Buckley's space. I managed to bribe one of the janitors with extra snacks. Never underestimate the power of common items in the penitentiary. Buckley had left his computer on without signing out. Navigating the digital database of various inmate profiles was tricky. While I wanted to look up different names, I decided to focus on the young girl. I searched for every Anna until I found the one I was looking for. A few things stood out to me about her right away. The main body of text on her infractions had many redactions. I printed it out and grabbed the papers. I closed the door behind me and headed down the hallway back to my lodging. I read the document on my walk. Even though she was only 20 years old, she was also a nuisance to society. She burnt down a halfway house that she was staying at. She was there for many DUIs. Several judges gave her breaks. They decided to put her in mental health facilities instead of jail. She kept assaulting the staff there. The worst of these was when she stabbed a nurse in the jugular. The RN survived but had to talk through a voice box for the rest of her life. I was right outside my door when I heard a familiar voice. You're out late. 
Seal and Wosu said, I turned around and saw his large frame. In the two months I had been there, I got to know the man well. He had come here from the Arizona State Prison Complex. We had swapped similar stories. His tales of the encounters he had with death row prisoners intrigued me. What do you have there? Nwosu asked. A guidebook on how to perform a successful exorcism. I lied. I didn't think you liked working off duty. We do what we have to. How did you get it? They won't let us use the internet here. Found it under the seat of the mobile unit, I said. I did not feel good about falsifying information to a peer I had respect for. Oh, I see. I came here to ask if you have any extra coffee. I'm out, and I don't want to go all the way to my locker to get some in the morning if I can help it. No problem, I said as I unlocked the door and invited him in. I stuffed the papers under my mattress so he would not be able to read them. I reached into my backpack and pulled out some instant packets. I gave them to him and saw that he stared at my collection of books. At the far end was a Bible. His eyes locked on it. He grabbed the coffee packs and looked at me. Do you believe what they're telling us? Nosu asked. What do you mean? About God and the devil. All these biblical villains taking control of all the people here. It seems far-fetched to me. There has to be something more going on. What if this is an asylum for those with undiagnosed mental illness? The kind researchers aren't advanced enough to understand yet. Have you ever thought of that? I sat down. I don't think science has the answer, I said. The ones in here are gifted with preternatural abilities. It's like they can read our minds, or at least our pasts, no matter how secretive we are. I never felt as though I have less power than I do since I came here. All I know is I can't pretend to understand everything, whether it's celestial or empirical. I cannot feign understanding of the evil within these walls. To pretend otherwise is arrogance. Buckley, Nuosu, a priest, and I walked together to Anna's cell. We could hear her screaming from within a 300-foot distance. The other lamentations of the prisoners became drowned out by her wails. We entered her cell. Words written in blood were on the wall. They were Latin. She stared at us with a smile. Her face seemed puffier than usual, which emphasized the wounds on her face. The priest pulled out a rusted black crucifix. He raised it in her direction as he approached her. Her screams grew louder with each advancing step. He pulled out a small pocket Bible and read a prayer from it. Saint Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Host, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all evil spirits who wander through the world for the ruin of souls. Amen. Her eyes became less opaque. I was able to make out their green color for the first time. She gazed at me and spoke intelligible words for the first time since her forced visitation. Your mother died an early death because she found out you joined a gang, Anna said with a mocking laugh. I looked around to see if anyone was staring at me with judgment. The expressions were neutral until they turned into worry. Everyone in the room knew they would have to wait their turn for public humiliation. You accepted a bribe to stay silent after an inmate stabbed another one to death, she said to Nuosu. Nuosu muttered something under his breath. He stated the inmate was a horrible person who mistreated children. He commented on how the earth was lighter without the presence of such a person weighing it down. You, Anna said as she stared at Buckley, you are the worst out of everyone. Your wife dies by drowning, and you received up her life insurance money. Wait until they look deeper into that. What I saw next horrified me. Buckley screamed out the word, no, as he lunged at her. His hands wrapped around her throat before one of her legs broke free from its binding and kicked him in the ribs. He must have forgotten to wear his vest that day because he folded and landed on the ground. The priest placed the cross on her forehead and left a permanent mark there. She passed out. Her exhalation before she lost consciousness made her body deflate into unnatural thinness. Buckley called me into his office the next day. He asked me to take a seat with a menacing tone. He slammed the door and sat behind his desk. Do you even want to work here anymore? I know this employment opportunity is a very unique one. It's not for everyone. You knew when you became a CEO that this type of job requires more mental fortitude than most professions. This isn't any different because we're operating in uncharted territory. Have I done something wrong? I asked. 
You entered my office after hours, he said as he banged his fists on the table. I don't know what your motivation was. Are you starting to believe what some of these inmates are saying about me? They don't see our sins with full impunity. They know enough about our interior lives and what bothers us enough to get under our skin. It is us versus them. Once you side with the enemy, then you're no good to the team here, let alone me. If you're running some kind of vigilante investigation against me, two can play that. Believe me when I say you don't want to be on my bad side. If you're going to fire me, I said, I won't make excuses. You should know I was not trying to get you in trouble or dig up any dirt. I wanted to look up any at all information I could on Anna. She seemed to be more in control of what possessed her than the others. I wanted to figure out what made her so unique in that regard. I figured if I ever wound up possessed, I could weaponize whatever she used. You're like a child, he said as he stood and paced back and forth. Do yourself a favor and stay within your pay grade. The Vatican has hired scientists to study behavior during possessions. In the old days, they would have dismissed it as different demons. You don't have a degree in microbiology any more than I do. We are muscle hired to make sure the demonologists are safe when they do their job. So you do yours. Yes sir. I felt as though I had backed down and given him some sort of sovereignty over me. I also knew if I lied or resisted it would only lead to a loss of money for my family and me. Count yourself lucky, he said, as he sat back down and picked up a pen. I'm not reporting your mistake to any of my superiors. Do not make me regret giving you this break. Now get out of here before I change my mind. I made my way to the threshold. I faced him as I began to turn the knob. One question, I said. Most of the time inmates come shipped here in groups. Anna arrived alone. Why was she given special treatment during her transport? Is she a celebrity, the daughter of a famous politician? It's within my rights to know as someone who has to check up on her. Anna is my daughter, Buckley said as he scribbled on a pad and motioned me to leave. As time went on, I saw humanity behind the violent demeanor of many inmates. A common fear of correctional officers is susceptibility to manipulation by the incarcerated. I tried not to become a victim of my empathy. One of the prisoners named Aluko managed to escape. I collected information on how he did it. Rumors abounded that he had turned a toothbrush into a pick. He allegedly weakened the concrete around his barred window. Another tale given was how he overpowered one of the correctional officers. The officer was too embarrassed to admit it, so they tried to cover it up. Aluko was a massive man. There was no shame in losing an unarmed combat match with him. The lack of weapons used left me baffled. The strangest part of the story was not how he escaped. It became obvious the inmates had some sort of intelligence. They were not as impulsive as we judged them to be. They had the basic want of freedom or the cruel entities that controlled them did. The most unsettling part of Aluko's fleeing was not how he managed to scale the barbed wire, nor was it his willingness to traverse the tundra. What perplexed me the most was how his life ended when he was less than half a mile away from the prison. It was not the elements that took him. Something had torn him apart. The theory of it having been a polar bear spread. They wanted a meal to go with their coke. One of the officers joked in the briefing room. I did not find the lame quip funny and neither did the warden. Our general lack of civility was not uncommon but some jokes were intolerable. While many of us wrote it off as a polar bear attack, there was one aspect of the butchery not in alignment with that. Aluko's eyes are missing from his skull, a member of the search team said. Something carved an upside down cross carved into his chest, or what's left of it. Medics came back and told us everything they had seen. The brass took over the investigation shortly afterward. I asked one of the priests what could have ended his life. What kind of wraith-like being could perform such a precise and terrifying mutilation? I asked. This has the makings of an attack by Azazel, the priest said. That particular type of demon wanders the wilderness. It can take many forms. Be on the lookout for anything resembling a goat. If you see horns when you are doing an outside perimeter check, be sure to recite a prayer and use this. He handed me a crucifix. My stubborn agnosticism did not want to accept it as a believable weapon. I relented because he was so polite. Buckley called us into his office. When we got there, he did not slam the door as I expected him to. Sio Nuosu and I gazed at each other with alarm as Buckley waved at us to follow him. 
He took us to an elevator in one of the back chambers that I had earlier dismissed as a room for the cleaning crew. An elevator was there, he opened it, had us step inside, and led us down to the basement. The subterranean cellar was completely barren except for two items. One was a stained glass window that depicted the Virgin Mary coated in ice. The second was an electric chair. I did not know the prison had such a chamber. Everything about the seat looked old. It seemed to belong to a medieval era rather than having come from decades ago. The arms of the chair had the faces of gargoyles at the ends of them. I've been talking to officers about this, he said. As a team, everyone is culpable, except for me. The procedures we maintain of checking on the subjects every hour are important. It wasn't written as a flexible guideline. It exists for a reason. For an inmate to manage a successful escape attempt does not look good on us or to the higher-ups in Rome. I don't know if you were lazy or scared to do your jobs, but either way, you need to toughen up and develop a work ethic. Otherwise, it's going to get ugly fast. I had the policy changed. Regardless of how understaffed we may be, you are now going to do six routine checks on the inmates every hour. If I hear a single complaint coming from your lips, you will regret it beyond measure. Are we clear? After a silence ensued, Buckley called us incompetent once more and dismissed us. Nosu took the elevator up. I turned around and spoke to Buckley. Warden, I have a question. I did not permit you to ask one. I suppose after the beat down I gave you, I'll allow it out of pity. Do any of the inmates have the demons driven out of them? And if so, where do they go afterward? Do they go back to the prison they came from? Are they granted immunity and allowed to go home? Do the exorcisms make them purer than what they were before? You are nothing more than pond scum with a badge, Buckley said with a sneer. Don't ask questions if your wage doesn't merit it. How many times do I have to tell you? I was only wondering because I have not seen Anna in a while. Watch what you say and get out of my face. You are a hair breadth away from me documenting your insubordination. Although I loved pushing his buttons, I did not want the negative consequences. I left the room. I did not yearned to be the newest execution there. I went up into one of the towers. I looked out at the expensive plains of frost and woodland. Buckley's threats and bullying were starting to get to me more than usual. Verbal abuse in my industry was not uncommon. Something about his irate tone under these conditions made it sting much worse. It filled me with a certain anger that I did not know how to resolve. I figured getting some fresh air and doing a bit of investigating would help me stay preoccupied. I needed to clear my mind. Aluko's escape gave a negative impression of my work performance. I still refused to believe his death was some sort of natural phenomenon. I brought a sniper rifle with me. I looked through the scope. The bullets had a cross carved into each of them. I tried to trace the exact path Aluko took when he made his final attempt at getting back into society. I carried a night vision device to help me see through the darkness. A half hour later, I saw a movement. It was subtle at first. Snow fell from tree branches. My heart raced as I saw a figure wandering through a thick cluster of pines. It was a woman in a nightgown as white as the hills around her. Backward arching horns protruded from her forehead. The way she moved was peculiar. Her steps did not seem to telegraph any sort of movement, as though she was floating. There were no indentations in the snow behind her. Her head tilted to the side. The last frozen feeling she wore on her face was one of pain. She seemed to suffer a sort of paralytic neck injury. A black-tailed deer was only 20 feet from her. She sneaked behind it, predatory. What I saw next disturbed me. The deer's torso opened. A crimson spurt littered the snow with puddles of red fluid. The ethereal woman reached down and tried to grab some of the eviscerated body parts. Her hands sunk through the chunks of meat. She wailed at that moment. I squeezed the trigger. It connected. Her chest tore, two sheets splitting apart. Her scream became even more voluminous. She exploded like an effigy, incandescent in the Arctic. She evaporated into ashes. The flames went away and so did the spirit. A pile of blackened and smoldering embers got carried away by the wind. They decorated the trees as though it was a macabre Christmas stage setup. The next night, I visited Nuosu in his room. His place was a mess. He was usually clean and organized. His few paperback books, sci-fi military adventures, were strewn about on the floor. I noticed he also had half a bottle of scotch on his nightstand, which was a definite violation. We were not allowed to drink. 
The threat of an emergency forced us to maintain sobriety. Still, I was not going to snitch on him. I think I killed a demon, I said as I took a seat across from him. I searched high and low for the body and couldn't find it. One of the preachers told me it was a particular type of evil called Azazel. I looked at Nanuosu and saw that his eyes seemed to stare out for a thousand yards toward his ceiling. What's wrong, man? I asked. I found the death ledger, he said. I don't understand. Whoever flipped the switch on the electric chair we saw yesterday kept a log book. Everybody whose life he ended. There have been exactly 106 people killed in that chair. Sure, some of them were repugnant before their possession. Others got locked up for a seatbelt violation. There's no consistency in regards to why they were worthy of capital punishment. Nosu pulled out a manila volume. He tossed it my way. I flipped through it and saw many names. Some struck me as familiar. Did you have any suspicion they were killing people under our noses? No, I said. I searched the papers for dates to see how recent or old the incidents of annihilation were. All were within the last year. There was a weird energy in the electric chair room. Nuosu said, What you banished out in the woods may have been the spirit of an already possessed yet dead person. It's possible that when they're killed their demonic selves stay on this plane. They could choose to haunt us. Could be every ghost story written since the beginning of time is the darker half of a human lingering. I must admit I don't know who would want to stay in a place like this at all, though. I nodded. I also began to wonder if it was it was correct, or if he was losing his sanity. I helped Aluko escape. Nuosu said as he turned to face me, The conditions of this place appall me. I want to assist many more. I had never seen a prisoner transported via helicopter. My sixth month of working at the facility changed that. It landed on a helipad made of yellow and blue paint. The pilot and guard took the detainee out of the chopper. They were both army personnel. The stripes on their uniforms indicated they were not low level within the military. As I watched this from one of the towers, I could not help but wonder who the new inmate was. The person tried to give the captors a struggle. Both were strong and did not seem particularly worried. They kept the person under control. I observed the subject's clothing during the escort down to the top floor of the cells. A black burlap sack was over their head. A large blanket covered them. It was impossible for me to even gauge the basic silhouette of the individual. I had seen many kinds of transport but none so high profile. It made me contemplate if they were an insurgent from some faraway land. I pondered if they were a kingpin of some nefarious domestic terror group. I asked one of the other officers if they knew anything about the person. They told me the subject was in the hole, the most isolated cell on the grounds. Orders were not to take the burlap sack off of the person's head. This perturbed me a great deal. I asked if we had any information on the person. I already knew the answer would be vague if there would be any sort of concrete backstory at all. I met the warden in one of the break rooms as he was eating steak. It was better than the freeze-dried and prepackaged artificial slop they gave to those of us lower in rank. I became jealous in a matter of seconds. You told us to watch the prisoners more, I said as I folded my arms. Who is looking out after the one in solitary? What makes them get room floors above the rest of the general population? Is this person the country's most prolific serial killer or something? What would merit such severe protections? I don't create the law here, he said with a mouthful. Believe it or not, I'm kept in the dark about a lot of things as well. Don't assume because I'm not a grunt that I have all the details you so crave. Do me a favor, when you get out of here next month, take it up with the big guys in Italy, especially the one with the funny hat. I'm sure they would love to hear your thoughts. While you're there, tell them I deserve a promotion. That same night, I went up to the top level and walked past the door that led to the solitary cell. Though I could not see inside because it was a wall of pure concrete, I did hear the wails of the prisoner. They sounded familiar. I was doing my routine checks and I passed one of the cells which belonged to an inmate named Andre. He sat straight up and stared at me. I could tell something was different about him. He was not writhing on his cot nor was he struggling with the usual muscle contractions. He walked up to me. The barrier between us did not give me a perfect feeling of protection. I am cured, he said. The usual milky pupils most of the inmates had been things he was now devoid of. You are doing much better, I said. I've never seen anyone look as clear-headed as you do now, not around here anyways. How are you feeling? Paranoid. 
Do you know what they do to people like me? After they've driven the evil out of us, they send us to a mega church in the Rockies. The church has its propaganda machine. They turn us into pamphlet writers or social media manipulators. Missionaries for their so-called God. I would rather have Beelzebub as my host than be a door-to-door -door Bible salesman. Who told you that? Your boss, Buckley. I wouldn't worry about that. He tends to say a lot of mean things to get a rise out of people. You don't understand. The transporting officers have told the other inmates the same thing. They can't all be in on one big lie like that. No offense, but none of you are that organized. I won't argue with you there. They say that once we're sent to their cult-like compound, we must comply. If we refuse to work for the church, they put the demons back inside of us. They know how to weaponize those demons. It's not all about exercising them anymore if it ever was. It's about using them to control us. Andre's hand slipped through the metal food flap. He held a shank. The tip of the blade pierced through the midsection of my vest. I grabbed his wrist and wrestled the knife away from him until it clattered on the floor. I got hold of the webbing of his hand and broke a few of his fingers. I yelled for backup. Another correctional officer came by and sprayed holy water into the slot. When it did nothing, we switched over to pepper spray and sent him to the ground. Inmates using dirty tricks and distractions to try and get one over on me was nothing new. That particular incident made me very spiteful and paranoid though. When I patrolled the cells the next day, Andre was nowhere to be found. I found they shipped him somewhere else. I wondered if it was to the nightmare place of forced worship he had described. Nuosu had lent me a copy of Milton's Paradise Lost. I felt obligated to give it back to him. After I finished the last page, I went outside and knocked on Nuosu's door. There was no answer. I went back into my room and grabbed a flashlight. I walked up to the door again and banged on the barrier with the metal device. Even with the reverberation, Nuosu still did not call out or come to the door. I had seen him fall into unhealthy habits, which were worse for wear. His motivation to help people flee had gotten the best of him. His drinking had spiraled out of control due to the stress level he was under. I kicked the door down. I could not tolerate the thought of letting him die by choking on his vomit after an intense bender. The room was empty and clean. None of his stuff was there. I walked into Buckley's office the next day. One of the inmates smuggled a pistol in, I said. Impossible, Buckley said as his eyes widened. I need your help in assessing the cell, sir. There might be some ballistics evidence. You believe he used the gun? Yes, I said. I escorted Buckley to the chamber. It was a mess. Items were strewn about everywhere. Where's the gun? I braced my knuckles with a small baton and punched Buckley in the temple. He fell. I took his service weapon and master keys. I walked out to the hallway and shut the door immediately. I waited for him to recover and come to. When he did, he shook his head like he was waking up from a deep sleep and gazed at me with pure hatred. What do you think you're doing, Lieutenant? Buckley said as he touched the side of his head for blood. I want you to tell me what happened to my best friend. No lies this time. Where did Nuosu go? You do too much. Nothing worse than someone a kid picked on in high school who gets into this profession. They always overcompensate. Sometimes it's better to not be proactive. Wait till you get out in the field. You'll learn that lesson an even harder way if you live that long. I'll tell the boys you gave a direct order to leave this level alone. You'll be here until you starve and dehydrate. I don't want to be cruel, but you need to start answering my questions or we're going to have problems. Who is the prisoner who came and cloaked the other day? Is it Nuosu? Is he possessed? Buckley glared at me and did not answer. I stared down at the master keys. Last chance to tell me, I continued. I'm going to do my investigation if you don't help me. Fuck off. There's something I will say though. Ever since Anna came here, they changed some procedures. One on how those related to the officers get booked in here. Don't hate me. I don't make the rules. I wanted to ask him to elaborate, but I was getting angrier with him by the second. I left him there and went to solitary confinement. 
I went to the most isolated holding chamber on the property. When I opened the door, I found a yellow hallway that ended in darkness. I turned on my torch and walked down the vestibule with a hand on my service weapon. I found the prisoner in the corner, their hands tied to the bed. The burlap sack was still over their face. I ripped it off. My wife stared back at me. Her face had cracked skin and was paler than I could ever remember. I stumbled backward at the sight of her. No, I said through gritted teeth. As the dawn of my new reality cascaded over me, I punched the wall. I broke a few knuckles. I knew what I had to do. I undid the restraints on the bedding and zip tied her wrists together. I did not want the presence which controlled her to fight me. You never told me you were in a gang that you used to rob innocent people, she said as I led her down the hallway. Her voice was not my wife's, but sounded the way an actress might on scrambled television. I brought her to the first level. I walked her past prison bar doors after I used the master keys to gain access to them. It was snowing when we went outside. Where are you going? I turned around and saw an officer I had met many times. Michael Patterson had the face of a bulldog. He never allowed anyone to think he was anything but a consummate professional. Humor was something he was incapable of. The most powerful priest is out on sick leave, I said. He's possessed himself. I have direct orders to take her to the city. I'm going to drive her to one of the churches there. Did Buckley give you any paperwork authorizing this? It's in the prisoner transport vehicle over there, I said, pointing at the SUV 300 feet away. Let me get her situated for the drive, and I'll be right back with it. Patterson nodded and gave tacit approval. Once we were in the car, I hit 60 miles per hour and drove far away from that wretched place. It took two weeks to get back to our home state. I returned to my house in the middle of the night, so the neighbors would not see my wife in the state she was in. The next morning, I restrained her to our bed. I went to the local church and managed to convince a priest to help me. I had to persuade Father Park I was not a delusional person. When he arrived in our bedroom, he knew the case was legitimate. Park performed a lengthy seven-hour exorcism. I walked him to the door. My wife had already become lucid again. She did not have any memories of what led to her being in my workplace. I have tried to pray and purify this house, Park said as I opened the front door. If I were you, I would consider moving. As the priest walked up to his car, I got his attention again by calling out his name. Father, I said, I've been meaning to ask, how do we protect ourselves from possession so I can ensure that this never happens again? Demons are like falsehoods, Park said. No matter how intelligent you may be, you could fall victim to believing something not based on facts. We have to guard ourselves against lies and deception. In the same way, we have to always be at the ready when our senses tell us something evil is afoot. I closed the door and went upstairs. I embraced my wife. How did the assignment go? She asked. I'm changing industries. Thank you to my super fans, Sweet Black Swan, Tacy, and Brooklyn. I really appreciate you supporting my channel, and I look forward to making more content for everyone.